Good morning, who said hurry up? <laughs> Good morning everybody, welcome to BH1 Eden Church, welcome to Discover Church who are joining with us today. Really great to have you all here with us. Would you stand with me? We're going to come to a place of praise and worship this morning. We're going to lift up the name of the Lord. We're going to declare His goodness to the heavens. We're going to declare His goodness to each other. We're going to uh, really just enter into a place of worship. Psalm 106 says, Praise the Lord. I'll give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all His praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I might look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I might rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I might glory with your inheritance? Do we glory with the inheritance that we have this morning? Do we glory with the inheritance that we have in God as His children? You know, when when we come to Christ, when we give our lives to Him, we become part of His family. And if that's not a reason to praise and worship with you this morning, then I don't know what it is. Let's pray. Father, today, we thank you. We thank you, God, that we can come to your house, a house of prayer for all nations. We thank you, God, that we can lift up your name, that we have the freedom and liberty to go to worship you in this way. Bless us this morning through that and in our fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've uh, just, uh, before we start, as we went, notice we've got no Sunday school at the moment through August. We're giving all our Sunday school leaders a, a well-deserved break. Um, but any of the young people, children that want to, are welcome to use that area out there where the sofas are, uh, or the back wall, go out there, just please stay out the kitchen, and any younger, tiny ones, uh, if the parent could go with them out there, that would be great. Bless you. Let's worship.
beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. Lord, that is the God. You are the God that we are able to bow the knee before today. And Lord, whether we are physically bowing the knee, whether we are bowing the knee in our hearts, whether we are, we are, whether we are going and bowing the knee in a private place, just ourselves before you, Lord, today we just ask God that as we bow the knee, as we put you in your rightful place in our lives, that as we put ourselves in our right place before you, which is on our knees, God, today, we pray that as we humble ourselves before you, Lord, you will raise us up. You'll raise us up, Lord, above our troubles, above our struggles, above our difficulties, above the trials of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to ask our musicians to sing through that song again. You know, we don't make a habit of, of kneeling. We don't have kneeling cushions. Although I think we're a great idea. But I'm going to invite you, if you are physically able to do so, and if your heart is leaning that way this morning, just to kneel before God as we sing these words.
a group of people. Um, anyway, um, on Friday we uh, had our barbecue. It was an amazing time of fellowship, fun, games. I got rugby tackled to the floor, thanks Jack. Um, I want to thank Mark um, for providing food, Paul for providing the beach hut, and just everyone that came for making it a really special time, uh, just enjoying being together, which was really nice. Next thing, um, last, was it Thursday, the exam results were for six four? It was, yeah. Thursday was exam results time for, um, for six formers, the ones that are ending, and they're going now into uni or um, Bible college or Joe. And um, I came up to Mark this morning and I was like, Mark, I really feel that we need to pray for young people. And he was like, yeah, I know what I was going to anyway. <laughs> so it's really cool to us that we're on the same path. But we've got Joe going to, where are you going to? Actually, just come out. Now, Joe, come out. Elliot, you're going to uni as well. You come out. Rachel, you're coming. You come out. Jack, I'm picking on you. Come out. You can. I think it'd be cool to ask. I'm kind of taking over now. Sorry. Um, yeah, just say if you're happy with your grades, and then. <laughs> um, no, just say where you're going and what you're doing. Uh, you need a face there, everyone. Right, okay, I'll start with Rachel first, what's your next thing? Um, I got into the University of Worcester, so I'm going there in September to study creative writing. Cool. Uh, I got into Lincoln University and I'm going to study business. I'm happy. <laughs> And Lord, 
Lord today, we do pray for every single one of our young people. Every, the, those standing here in the front and those also who are, who are interspersed throughout this congregation today. And even those who are not with us, Lord God, we pray for them and we lift them up and we just say, Lord, in this uncertain world, in this world which would deny you, in this world which would, which would look towards other things as right instead of you. Father, today... We pray that each one of these young people will have the strength, the courage, the fortitude to stand for their faith, to stand for you, to acknowledge you before their peers. And Lord, may every single one of them have an incredible amount of fun. Lord, may they apply themselves, may they learn, may they, may they take on knowledge, but not only knowledge, wisdom also. And Lord God, may every single one of them as they do that, as they form new friendships and new relationships, Lord, may each one of them know what it is to acknowledge you and to know the joy of their salvation and to live in that incredible joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let's stand together and give worship the Lord. I'm not going to say worship the Lord again, we're going to continue to worship the Lord.
as we share the body and the blood of Jesus together. We thank you, God, that we can do that, that we can honor your sacrifice as we do. Hallelujah. Just take seats just for a couple of moments for you. I'm reading the same passage that, uh, the part of the same passage that Pastor Malcolm read last week. 1 Corinthians 11, which we know so well because we read it so often at communion, says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed to bread when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. Those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment upon themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we have been disciplined, so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat at home, so that when you eat together, it may not result in judgment. I found myself sitting and asking myself this question yesterday afternoon, why, why do we do communion? Why do we share this? We know that these are symbols where we don't believe in transubstantiation, that, that we don't believe that this physically becomes the flesh and the blood of Jesus when we eat it. They are symbols. This is a symbolic act. But why do we do this? Why is it so important? that we share this symbolic act together. And just from this passage, I've picked it, don't worry, I'm not going to preach, but I've just picked out six reasons why we share this together. Verse 24. When he had given thanks, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance. When we share this together, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Why is it important that we remember the sacrifice of Jesus? Simply because it is the most significant act that has ever happened in the history of the universe. Nothing, nothing comes close to the act of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his death and his resurrection. We also thank God when we take this. We live in thankfulness. The same verse 24. When he had given thanks, Jesus lived a lifestyle of thankfulness. It's not about saying grace before a meal because it's something that we do, you know, rub and dub dub, cheers for the grub, I'm, I'm not being uh, sacked, I'm, I'm not, we, we live a lifestyle of thankfulness. It's not something that we just throw away. We live our lives in thanks to God for what he has done. We proclaim, verse 26, when you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. By sharing this together, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We proclaim our allegiance to him. We proclaim that we are Christian. Yeah. What does that mean? It's nothing to do with where we're born, how we're, how we're raised even. It's to do with us submitting ourselves to Christ and acknowledging that we are sinful and that his blood covers our sins. It's restitution for our sins. It's about how we live, not just in ourselves, but with one another. That is what we proclaim when we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Next, verse 28, we examine ourselves. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink from the cup. It is so important that we examine ourselves regularly. Search me, O Lord, and try me, the word says. We examine ourselves because by examining ourselves, we lay ourselves open before God. We know that there is nothing of ourselves which we can hide from God. There is no such thing as a secret place. 
when we're before him. Lamentations says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. You know, when we lay ourselves open, we examine ourselves, our motives, before God, it brings us closer to him. It's an act of fellowship, verse 33, so then, my, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. This declares our fellowship. We do this together as an act of unity before him. And lastly, it's an act of expectation. Verse 26 says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Are we expecting? Are we expecting for God? Are we expecting for his return? Are we expecting for him to do something in our lives? Are we expecting for him to answer our prayers? When Peter and John were walking up to the temple gate in Acts chapter 3, there was a beggar and he looked at them because he was expecting to get something for, from them. He got something even bigger than he ever expected. Because didn't Peter say, silver and gold, I have got, but I have got, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Today, can we raise our expectations before God? Can my two others come out? Father, we thank you for this body and this blood. We thank you for the sacrifice that you have given. And Lord, we ask that you will bless this to us in Jesus' name. Amen. These guys are just going to bring this round. And I'm going to ask you this week just to hold on to it and wait until everybody's been served and we'll share this together in that act of unity.
Let us let us share the body and the blood of Jesus.
Lord, would your spirit break out in this place? Would your spirit break out in our lives? We're so thankful, Lord, that you gave us your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to empower us. Father, we thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the fruit of your Holy Spirit, which grows in our lives when we spend time in your presence. Today, Lord, as we come around your word, let us look to you, let us acknowledge you in our hearts, and may you break out in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you to our worship team. Thank you, Lord. Well, I said, uh, I said last week, if you remember, I changed my message at the last moment, and I said I'll bring the message I had next week, and that's actually going to have to wait until the week after, or the week after that, so I think I'll to preach it next week. Um, because what I'd forgotten at that point was that Joseph was in the diary to preach this week, and uh, it's your second, third, fourth time. Okay. <laughs> Well, that means that we're going to scrutinize you even stronger. We're going to be sitting making notes. And, um, no, as, as uh, Joseph prepares for Bible College, obviously, uh, we just want to um, bless him and give him an opportunity to do that. So let's pray with Joseph. Now, Father, we thank you for a young man who holds your word dear to his heart. Lord, as he brings your word to us that you have laid upon his heart, Lord, I know the hours that he has put into the preparation of this. Lord, we pray today that you'll take away any nerves and that God, you will just give him uh, your Holy Spirit free reign in his life to bring what he has for you, for us today, from you, in Jesus' name. Two, one, two, Hello. So today um, I've got a message which God gave me uh, quite a while ago and I felt it before today, I'm not sure why. Uh, but today's message is God's calling for mission, faith and spirit. And that's to be a person of mission, faith and spirit and to be a church of mission, faith and spirit. Because God has a different purpose for every one of us individually. Collectively these callings we work together to build up the church. And I'm here today to challenge you where you believe your calling is, what your purpose is in life, and how we're going to accomplish that as a church, and how we're going to work to get together collectively. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 says, Since you are eager for the gift of the Spirit, try to excel in it to build up the church. So the first point that I'd like to come across is mission. Where does your mission lie? Well, first off, let's look at our mission, because we've got our mission as a church, our collective calling as a church, and we've got our own individual callings. And uh, because we may all have different missions and callings in life, but as a church, we should all have the same goal, the same focus. Because when Jesus met with the disciples on the mountain in Galilee, what was Jesus' plan? To make disciples of all the nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our mission is one, to make disciples. To see people saved, living a life with Jesus, and to see that happening again and again and again and over again. Because if making disciples is our main focus, then how are we going to achieve that? But I strongly believe that mission should be our everyday life. We should be living in mission. We should constantly be discipling and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As, an, and as nice as it may be, making a disciple isn't getting someone to put their hand up in church and say yes. Making a disciple isn't going out to Bournemouth Town Centre and hanging out, handing out tracks to them. Making a disciple isn't even getting someone to say, I believe in God, because I can tell you that the devil believes in God, but I'm pretty sure it's not a disciple. <laughs> Making a disciple is walking a walk with someone, living their journey with them, teaching them, rebuking them, correcting them in the ways of the Lord, and loving them like Christ loved, like Christ loved us. Amen. Helping them to live a life packed out for Jesus, so every day they are walking and talking with Jesus, worshipping and praising Him in everything that they do, and getting themselves to a point where they can go out and they can make new disciples themselves. And I asked a few people what, their, what they thought the key factors were in being and making a disciple, and uh, here are some of the answers that I got given. 
For me, making someone who's undoubted in faith and being someone who's undoubted in faith, being humble, boldness, being full of the Holy Spirit, wanting every day to give and be there for others and giving all the glory to God and not for themselves. Next one says, being a disciple is walking and walk with them, walking in their life and teaching, not just teaching by a book, but teaching and leading by example. Jesus makes disciples by walking and talking with them, living life with them, living and teaching by example. The next one says, Jesus said to make disciples by teaching them to obey everything he has commanded the disciples. So reading, meditating, and obeying his word is essential to be a disciple. I would also say being a disciple is to be a part of the Christian community. There is no low range of Christianity. You need to be rooted in the covenant community of God. That means being active in the church, but also to what the church in history has said and done. And the final one, Christ-likeness, integrity, and authenticity, vulnerability, friendship, fellowship, pastoral care, and all teaching is applied to along the way, so all learning is lived and not just known. Our mission as a church is to be a church of disciples that sees more and more disciples made. We as a church should live up to our name, Eden. The name Eden comes from Exodus 15, 27, and it's a place where the children of Israel, whilst in the desert, refreshed themselves by the cool springs and sheltered themselves beneath the palm trees of the oasis, bearing the name Eden. Let's be a church that reflects that. Let's be a church that reflects the refreshment and shelter so the new disciples coming in feel safe and a home of peace and they can truly know the refreshment and shelter of God. So we've got our mission, which is to go make disciples. But what's your mission? What is your purpose? And before I go into this further, let me ask you, what is your idea of according to mention? If you've been given an individual purpose, a mission, and a calling to go and do something specific for God's work, what does that look like to you? What do you picture your life being like? I'd like to have a look at a significant example in the Bible of Jesus calling someone. Most of you have probably heard of Simon Peter in the Bible. Now Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, brought Simon at the time to Jesus. John 1, 41 says, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Where do you see yourself serving? 
let me just put it out there, serving according to ministry doesn't always mean giving up your job, giving up everything you have and going full time into leadership. Many people throughout the Bible, including Jesus himself, all had jobs. Jesus was a carpenter, Peter was a fisherman, Paul was a tent maker, Matthew was a tax collector, John was a fisherman, and Luke was a physician. So all these people who had calling into ministry all had an everyday life. They had ordinary jobs. But does this mean that they only did Jesus-based stuff when they weren't working? No. Being in work is another opportunity to minister. To be in the work, ministering to people around you, ministering to people through your job, discipling the people you meet, discipling your programs. If you've thought about your purpose and your calling before, you may have seen your life and your family and your job all as roadblocks getting in the way of God's calling on your life. But let me tell you, where God is involved and where God calls you, there is always a way. No matter what your family circumstances are, no matter what job you're in, no matter what, how busy you are, if God's called you, there will be a way. Through Christ, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible. Don't let your everyday life become a roadblock, because it's not. God's calling is God's calling. Do not ignore it. I've heard loads of people in Bible college, and uh, I'm not saying that this is any of us, but then no, not specifically in mine, but fully expecting to go into a from, from our Bible college, they fully expect to go to a 700 person strong church, become a full time minister on a 40k a year salary. I'm sorry, but that's not how it works. <laughs> you might, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, if God specifically calls you to that at that time, then may He bless you. But don't let that be your expectation. <laughs> all of these people who Jesus called to be a part of ministry all had jobs. So now we know that, what is it that God's laid on your heart? Has God laid something on your heart? And how do we know if something is God calling us or just our own desires and love? Does God physically call us or do we have to seek Him? There are hundreds of questions that we could ask. You know, I also just have to mention that I do believe God's calling for us can change. There is a time and a place and a season for everything. The Bible doesn't say that if God has a purpose for you right now, then your whole life from then on until the end will be all about that mission. There can be a beginning and an end for the callings. The God we serve is an exciting God, a God of adventure and a God of new things. And just because you've got your calling and your purpose sorted out right now, doesn't mean it's not subject to change. Give it a couple of years and God can be pulling you in a new direction, for a new purpose, for a new time and a new mission. Or it could not. The one thing I'm not here to do is tell you what your mission is and to tell you what it most definitely will look like. But I am here to challenge you, to challenge you where you believe your purpose lies. So I would like to move on to the next point, but I just want to throw a couple of points out there before I move on. As much as I believe in God calling us to do something we didn't expect out of the blue, I am a firm believer in God using our own desires and our own plans in life for His good and for His ministry. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. How do we know if God, if God is calling us or if it's our own will? Well, a calling from God will never contradict Scripture. A calling from God will often be accompanied by confirmation through faithful people giving words, through scripture, and from the fruit that we bear from this calling. A calling from God will always result in God being glorified, never, ever, this is a big one, never self-glorification. And lastly, if you don't feel God is calling you to something specific, don't go out of your way trying to find something. As I mentioned, as a church, we have a collective calling, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. Live your everyday life, and whilst doing so, live it for the Lord. And I have nothing against seeking your calling, but going out of your way and distracting from what our main purpose is, is a bit much. And there's so many churches, especially at youth events, say, find your calling, search for your calling, is God calling you, find your calling. And whilst I do believe that if God is calling you, I do believe that if God is calling you something, God will call you to it. Jesus went to his disciples and he called them. God called his prophets. God called his people. And in the same way, if God has a purpose for you, a purpose to serve, and a purpose to place in the church, he will set your path straight. So don't get caught up in searching. Live out our instruction from Jesus to go and make disciples of all the nations. And on a daily basis, talk with God, pray with God, worship, praise, listen. And remember, praying is talking with God, and a conversation is two-way. In that, whilst listening, you may find God has a specific mission. So the next point I'd like to talk about is faith. Because if you have a mission, you have calling, you have to have faith. 
end of this becomes an overwhelming amount of God's peace and comfort. When we fully commit our plans to the Lord and fully place our trust in Him with everything we have, He will go over and beyond to give us hope, peace, and most of all, love. Growing up, we had to learn to really know what it is to live by faith, to fully trust in God for everything. Going into ministry to be a pastor doesn't always come with a glamorous salary. It's not as glamorous and wealthy as Joyce Meyer and Kenneth Copeland make out to be. <laughs> Especially, sorry, in a church fund. Watching my, parents, watching my parents fully trust in God all the time, truly living by faith, will always live with me. I learned by watching what it is to know, will not know what lies ahead. I know what it is to give, be given notice to move out of the house and not know where we're moving next. And yet, no matter what the circumstances are, not worry, not fear, and just fully putting our trust in God, doing everything we can and then leaving the rest to God. And in no way am I taking credit for this. This was my parents doing, and I was maybe learning and watching them. But seeing my parents put God above their fears, put God above their finances, put God above their worries, I saw that God abundantly blesses, goes over and beyond what we deserve. Let me tell you that is exactly how we should live. Every day, trusting in His faithfulness. Every day, trusting Him, uh, trusting in how we should live. Every day, trusting, uh, every day, casting out all fears. Letting go and letting God take the lead. Working for His kingdom and His glory and living by faith. Because not only is this way of life beneficial to us, it's beneficial to others. Because it's setting an example. If we want to be living in God's will, living for His purpose, we need to be living by example. And a big part of this is faith. We need to be putting God before all of our worries. What kind of an example will we set if we're living in constant fear? If all we're showing to the people around us is that we're worried about what lies ahead, that we're worried about our money and food, that we're worried about our jobs, what kind of example will we set it? Why would an unbeliever want to follow God that we're putting across as nothing but fear? I can tell you that they won't want that. Because the God I serve is full of faithfulness, compassion, blessing, and honor. The God I serve casts out all fears and anxiety. If an unbeliever sees us without doubt, without worry, with full trust and confidence, they are going to want that. That is the kind of example that we need to be setting. So we've got faith as in trusting God in our life and in our circumstances. And we've got faith as in having faith in God's will for us and His plans. Having faith that when God gives us a mission, and a purpose or a calling that He is completely with us on that. Even if God calls us to do something that seems completely undoable, unimaginable, and too big for us, we have to remember God is, is so much bigger than all of our problems. God is greater than our obstacles. I'd like to tell you the story of Abraham. I'm sure many of you know. Abraham was told by God that he would be a father of many nations, and his wife Sarah would bear him a child, even though they were very old. Sarah was 90. And he was a hundred when Isaac was born. This was really a wild experience as it was. But then God told Abraham to do the unthinkable, to kill Isaac, his own son. When Abraham received that order, he followed in faith. He didn't know the full reasoning behind it, but he followed God's order. God stopped Abraham just before he killed Isaac and rewarded him for his faith. And this is an incredible story and example of faith. We might not always know the full reason behind God calling us to do something. But we, what we are going to do is trust in His will for us. Trust in His plans, no matter how big or small. We live for God's kingdom, not our own. And the third point that I'd like to talk about is spirit. So we know that if God's given a purpose, we need to live by faith. And if God's called us, if God's given a mission, a purpose, then we need to be fully covered from top to bottom in the spirit. And this isn't just something we might need. This is a necessity. We're not perfect. We never will be. I, I myself, I mess up. I upset people. My sin sometimes, it does get better at me and I step up. I'm human. And that's going to keep on happening until the day I die. But however, what we should do is be living a life of repentance. Genuinely trying, genuinely striving and really pressing onwards to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. Because I hear so many people saying, well, if Jesus forgives me, if Jesus is going to forgive me of that sin, well, then I might as well go and do it. And that upsets me. Because Jesus laid down his life so that we can embrace his grace. 
know true forgiveness and give us an opportunity to live a life of goodness. Who am I to take advantage of that? Who would I be to take advantage of the forgiveness that Jesus died for? No. My Bible tells me in Galatians 5, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And a couple of verses on it says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. We are called for a purpose, for a mission. We are called to live our life in faith, and we are called to walk in the Spirit day out and day in to strive in and through that which God's called us to do. As I mentioned about setting an example and living by faith, we should do the same in spirit. Walking and talking, living and breathing in the spirit. Every day saying, God help me to be less like me and more like you. And also remember, walking in the spirit isn't just about being pure in that sense. Walking in the spirit is seeking God for guidance, trusting in his promises, counting every blessing, being a man or a woman of your word, letting your yes be yes and your no be no, letting your words be the words from the mouth of the Spirit, letting your Spirit guide your actions. In every day, in every way of living, living a life of per- uh, living a life which pursues the Spirit of God, opening up your heart and your soul to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Living in and by the Spirit is more than just a thought process, it's a lifestyle. It's a commitment which, in order to go and do God's will for us, we need to be fully living in. What does a live life live? What does a life lived in the Spirit look like? The spirit, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is what a live, life lived in the Holy Spirit looks like. And most importantly, or just as importantly, is walking in the gifts of the Spirit. Using the gifts that God has empowered us with through His Holy Spirit. Acts describes us through in and throughout. Right from the ascension of Jesus to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples to the birth of the early church and how the church was built and empowered by the guidance, presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The whole early church was birthed through the encounter with the Holy Spirit. So many churches, and I'm not naming names to which churches, but so many churches seem to have lost the presence of the Holy Spirit. They seem to have lost the realization of how important it is to be moving and using the gifts of the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, whilst writing the books of Acts, made it so blatantly clear that in order for the church to work and spiritually move and encounter God, the church needs to be actively moving in the gift of the Spirit, using those who build up the church. The church will fire for the work of the Holy Spirit. And 1 Corinthians 12, if we get that on screen, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, and through the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And let me tell you, we need to be a church on fire for the movement of the Holy Spirit. We are Pentecostal for a reason. Without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing but a monument. But with the power, gifting, and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are a movement. Strive for the gifts of the Spirit. In order to go forward in God's calling for us, we must be walking and walking with and in the Holy Spirit, with the empowerment and blessing that the Holy Spirit brings. So as I come to the end of this message, but to conclude with this, we are called by God for a mission. We as a church are called by God for a mission. We have a world out there who are falling and falling. A lost and broken and hurting generation who are blinded by the devil's feet. A lost, broken and hurting generation that are, uh, with families being ripped apart on a daily basis. Divorce rates are through the roof. Unemployment rates are through the roof. Parents scrambling to find food for their kids while some of them are out there driving a Mercedes Benz A class. Children as young as primary school ages confused about their gender, about who God made them to be, their identity. And then there's certain church leaders who are going around telling these young people, it's okay, be who you want to be, love who you want to love. And God is probably up there thinking, no, stop ruining it, learn to love my creation, learn to love the way that I love. 
We have a government which in times it seems like we've lost all hope in. Money crisis, health crisis, life crisis, and most of all, a lack of Jesus crisis. And it's in these times I'm asking myself, where is the church? Where are we when all of this is going on? And then I'm reminded, it's not the government that I put my trust in. It's not the things of the world that I put my trust in. It's God who I put my trust in. And I will trust this calling, and I will follow. I will raise my head above the waters. I will go out into all the nations and spread Jesus. I will press onwards and forwards for God's calling to mission, to faith, and to spirit. And I will not back down. So my last question is, will you, when God gives you a calling, will you follow? Will you stand firm and stand strong? When, give, when God gives you a mission, will you listen and follow in faith, trust in His plan for you, and go forward living and walking with the Holy Spirit? You are chosen and called by God, and you do have a purpose. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have given us a mission and a calling and a purpose in life. I thank you for what you did on, what you did for us on the cross. I thank you for making a way where there was no way. And Father, I pray that all of us will be living and walking in the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you give us courage to go out and make disciples, to see people, to see people's lives turn around. Lord, I pray that you will help us to live mission, faith, and spirit.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Let's share the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week. Uh, Karen and I, and Zoe and I, are on holiday this week. If you uh, need anything, uh, Pastor Malcolm and uh, uh, Elaine and Pastor Gareth and John are around. So. Uh, uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure most of you will get on just fine without us here. And we thank you for those who have uh, uh, blessed us and prayed for us whilst we've been off uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, we're back again next Sunday morning at 10:30. And uh, uh, obviously, as we get towards September, most of our uh, program will be restarting up again. Um, any prayer requests, please do put them onto the uh, church prayer WhatsApp group. If you're not part of that, um, just let me know and uh, we can take your number and we can uh, add you to that group. God bless you this week. God go with you.